Hi, and welcome to another extension video on biomolecules. We ended last time around with the functional details of amino acids and proteins. We also dive deeper into the role of proteins in our genetic code. Now, it's time to move on to the structure of proteins. The shape of a protein is critical to its function because it determines whether the protein can interact with other molecules. Protein structure depends on its amino acid sequence and local low energy chemical bonds between atoms in both the polypeptide backbone and in amino acid side chains. Proteins can be classified into different types on the basis of shape, constitution and nature of molecules. On the basis of their molecular shape, proteins can be fibrous or globular. When the polypeptide chains run parallel and are held together by hydrogen and disulfide bonds, then a fiber-like structure is formed. Such proteins are generally insoluble in water. Some examples are keratin, that is present in hair, wool and silk, and myosin, present in muscles. When the chains of polypeptides coil around to give a spherical shape, they result in a globular protein. These are often soluble in water. Insulin, hemoglobin, and albumin are the common examples of globular proteins. The globular structure of insulin, hemoglobin, and albumin are justified due to their functions in the bloodstream. On the basis of constitution, we have simple, conjugated, and derived proteins. Simple proteins are made up of only proteins, for example, albumin. Conjugated proteins are complex proteins that are combined with characteristic prosthetic groups, that is, non amino acid substances, such as nuclear proteins, that is, a combination of protein and nucleic acid, chromoproteins, that are a combination of protein and color pigments, etc. Proteins that are derived from simple or conjugated proteins by partial or complete hydrolysis are called derived proteins. Next, on the basis of nature of molecules, proteins can either be acidic, that is, exist as anions, or basic, that is, exist as cations. The mean value of the total pH level of plasma proteins is acidic. Now that we're done with the functions and types of proteins, it is time to discuss the structural characteristics of proteins. The structure and shape of proteins can be studied at four different levels that is primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary, each level being more complex than the previous one. Primary structure. Proteins may have one or more polypeptide chains. Each polypeptide in a protein has amino acids linked with each other in a specific sequence, and it is this sequence of amino acids that is said to be the primary structure of that protein. Any change in this primary structure, that is, the sequence of amino acids, creates a different protein. Next, we have secondary structure. The secondary structure of protein refers to the shape in which a long polypeptide chain can exist. They are found to exist in two different types of structures, that is, alpha helix and beta pleated sheet structure. These structures arise due to the regular folding of the backbone of the polypeptide chain due to hydrogen bonding between the carbon and O and minor H groups of the polypeptide bond. Alpha helix is one of the most common ways in which a polypeptide chain forms all possible hydrogen bonds by twisting it into a right-handed screw that is a helix with a minus NH group of each amino acid hydrogen bonded to the carbonyl O or the fourth amino acid from it. Amino acid 1 binds into amino acid 5, amino acid 2 binds to amino acid 6, and so on. In beta pleated sheet structure, all peptide chains are stretched out to nearly maximum extension and then laid side by side, which are held together by intermolecular hydrogen bonds. The strands of a beta pleated sheet may be parallel, pointing in the same direction meaning that their N and C termini match up, or anti-parallel, pointing in opposite directions, meaning that the N terminus of one strand is positioned next to the C terminus of the other. The structure resembles the pleated folds of drapery and therefore is known as beta-pleated sheet. 
These sheets are not straight and have pleats due to the tetrahedral geometry of the alpha carbon in each amino acid. Then we have tertiary structure. The tertiary structure of proteins represents the overall folding of the polypeptide chains, that is, further folding of the secondary structure. The tertiary structure is primarily due to the interactions between the R groups of the amino acids that make up the protein. R group interactions that contribute to tertiary structure include hydrogen bonding, ionic bonding, disulfide bridges, and hydrophobic interactions. For example, all groups with like charges repel one another, while those with opposite charges can form an ionic bond. Similarly, polar R groups can form hydrogen bonds and other dipole-dipole interactions. Also, important to tertiary structure are hydrophobic interactions, in which amino acids with non-polar hydrophobic R groups cluster together on the inside of the protein leaving hydrophilic amino acids on the outside to interact with surrounding water molecules. Finally, there's one special type of covalent bond that can contribute to tertiary structure, the disulfide bond. Disulfide bonds are covalent interactions formed between the sulfur atom of two cysteine residues. As structural bonds in proteins, disulfide bonds stabilize the polypeptide structure. Lastly, we have the quaternary structure. Some proteins are composed of two or more polypeptide chains referred to as subunits. The spatial arrangement of these subunits with respect to each other is known as a quaternary structure. For example, insulin is a protein composed of two chains, an A chain with 21 amino acids and a B chain with 30 amino acids. Protein found in a biological system with a unique three-dimensional structure and biological activity is called a native protein. When a protein in its native form is subjected to physical changes like change in temperature or chemical change like change in pH, the hydrogen bonds are disturbed. Due to this, globules unfold, the helix gets uncoiled and the protein loses its biological activity. This is called denaturation of protein. During denaturation, secondary and tertiary structures are destroyed, but primary structure remains intact. The coagulation of egg white on boiling is a common example of denaturation. If you guys are intrigued by the dynamic role of proteins in biological functions, I would encourage you to explore the field of proteomics. It is a study of proteomes that is, the entire set of proteins that is or can be expressed by a genome, cell, tissue or organism at a certain time. There are two main approaches to proteomic studies, one based on structure and one on quantitative regulation, the former leading to deeper understanding of protein-to-protein -protein interaction and the latter growing increasingly vital in studying differences between healthy and diseased states. They are respectively called structural and quantitative proteomics. And with that, this video is over. Thank you so much for watching. Stay curious.